The Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau Forward. This little treatise is part of a longer work, which I began years ago without realizing my limitations, and long since abandoned. Of the various fragments that might have been extracted from what I wrote, this is the most considerable and, I think, the least unworthy of being offered to the public. The rest no longer exists. Book 1. I mean to inquire if, in the civil order, there can be any sure and legitimate rule of administration, men being taken as they are, and laws as they might be. In this inquiry, I shall endeavor always to unite what right sanctions with what is prescribed by interest, in order that justice and utility may in no case be divided. I enter upon my task without proving the importance of the subject. I shall be asked if I am a prince or a legislator to write on politics. I answer that I am neither, and that is why I do so. If I were a prince or a legislator, I should not waste time in saying what wants doing. I should do it or hold my peace. As I was born a citizen of a free state and a member of the sovereign, I feel that, however feeble the influence my voice can have on public affairs, the right of voting on them makes it my duty to study them, and I am happy when I reflect upon governments to find my inquiries always furnish me with new reasons for loving that of my own country. Chapter 1. Subject of the First Book Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One thinks himself the master of others, and still remains a greater slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. What can make it legitimate? That question I think I can answer. If I took into account only force and the effects derived from it, I should say, as long as a people is compelled to obey, and obeys, it does well. As soon as it can shake off the yoke, and shakes it off, it does still better. For regaining its liberty by the same right as it took it away, either it is justified in resuming it, or there was no justification for those who took it away. But the social order is a sacred right, which is the basis of all other rights. Nevertheless, this right does not come from nature, and must therefore be founded on conventions. Before coming to that, I have to prove what I have just asserted. Chapter 2. The First Societies The most ancient of all societies, and the only one that is natural, is the family. And even so, the children remain attached to the father only so long as they need him for their preservation. As soon as this need ceases, the natural bond is dissolved. The children, released from the obedience they owed to the father, and the father released from the care he owed his children, return equally to independence. If they remain united, they continue so no longer naturally, but voluntarily, and the family itself is then maintained only by convention. This common liberty results from the nature of man. His first law is to provide for his own preservation. His first cares are those which he owes to himself, and as soon as he reaches years of discretion, he is the sole judge of the proper means of preserving himself, and consequently becomes his own master. The family, then, may be called the first model of political societies. The ruler corresponds to the father and the people to the children, and all, being born free and equal, alienate their liberty only for their own advantage. The whole difference is that, in the family, the love of the father for his children repays him for the care he takes of them, while in the state, the pleasure of commanding takes the place of the love which the chief cannot have for the peoples under him. Grotius denies that all human power is established in favor of the governed, and quotes slavery as an example. His usual method of reasoning is constantly to establish right by fact. It would be possible to employ a more logical method, but none could be more favorable to tyrants. It is then, according to Grotius, doubtful whether the human race belongs to a hundred men, or that hundred men to the human race, and throughout his book he seems to incline to the former alternative, which is also the view of Hobbes. On this showing, 
the human species is divided into so many herds of cattle, each with its ruler, who keeps guard over them for the purpose of devouring them. As a shepherd is of a nature superior to that of his flock, the shepherds of men, that is, their rulers, are of a nature superior to that of the peoples under them. Thus, Philo tells us, the Emperor Caligula reasoned, concluding equally well either that kings were gods or that men were beasts. The reasoning of Caligula agrees with that of Hobbes and Grotius. Aristotle, before any of them, had said that men are by no means equal naturally, but that some are born for slavery and others for dominion. Aristotle was right, but he took the effect for the cause. Nothing can be more certain than that every man born in slavery is born for slavery. Slaves lose everything in their chains, even the desire of escaping from them. They love their servitude, as the comrades of Ulysses loved their brutish condition. If then there are slaves by nature, it is because there have been slaves against nature. Force made the first slaves, and their cowardice perpetuated the condition. I have said nothing of King Adam or Emperor Noah, father of the three great monarchs who shared out the universe, like the children of Saturn, whom some scholars have recognized in them. I trust to getting due thanks for my moderation, for being a direct descendant of one of these princes, perhaps of the eldest branch, how do I know that a verification of titles might not leave me the legitimate king of the human race? In any case, there can be no doubt that Adam was sovereign of the world, as Robinson Crusoe was of his island, as long as he was its only inhabitant. And this empire had the advantage that the monarch, safe on his throne, had no rebellions, wars, or conspirators to fear. Footnote 1. Learned inquiries into public right are often only the history of past abuses, and troubling to study them too deeply is a profitless infatuation. From the Essay on the Interests of France in Relation to its Neighbors by the Marquis d'Argenson. This is exactly what Grotius has done. Footnote 2. See a short treatise of Plutarch's entitled That Animal's Reason. Chapter 3. The Right of the Strongest. The strongest is never strong enough to be always the master, unless he transforms strength into right and obedience into duty. Hence, the right of the strongest, which, though to all seeming meant ironically, is really laid down as a fundamental principle. But are we never to have an explanation of this phrase? Force is a physical power, and I fail to see what moral effect it can have. To yield to force is an act of necessity, not of will at the most, an act of prudence. In what sense can it be a duty? Suppose for a moment that this so-called right exists. I maintain that the sole result is a mass of inexplicable nonsense. For if force creates right, the effect changes with the cause. Every force that is greater than the first succeeds to its right. As soon as it is possible to disobey with impunity, disobedience is legitimate and, the strongest being always in the right, the only thing that matters is to act so as to become the strongest. But what kind of right is that which perishes when force fails? If we must obey per force, there is no need to obey because we ought, and if we are not forced to obey, we are under no obligation to do so. Clearly, the word right adds nothing to force. In this connection, it means absolutely nothing. Obey the powers that be. If this means yield to force, it is a good precept, but superfluous. I can answer for its never being violated. All power comes from God, I admit, but so does all sickness. Does that mean that we are forbidden to call in the doctor? A brigand surprises me at the edge of a wood. Must I not merely surrender my purse on compulsion? But even if I could withhold it, Am I in conscience bound to give it up? For certainly the pistol he holds is also a power. Let us then admit that force does not create right and that we are obliged to obey only legitimate powers. In that case, my original question recurs. 
Chapter 4. Slavery. Since no man has a natural authority over his fellow and force creates no right, we must conclude that conventions form the basis of all legitimate authority among men. If an individual, says Grotius, can alienate his liberty and make himself the slave of a master, why could not a whole people do the same and make itself subject to a king? There are in this passage plenty of ambiguous words which would need explaining, but let us confine ourselves to the word alienate. To alienate is to give or to sell. Now, a man who becomes the slave of another does not give himself, he sells himself, at the least for his subsistence. But for what does a people sell itself? A king is so far from furnishing his subjects with their subsistence that he gets his own only from them. And according to Rabelais, kings do not live on nothing. Do subjects then give their persons on condition that the king takes their goods also? I fail to see what they have left to preserve. It will be said that the despot assures his subjects civil tranquility. Granted, but what do they gain if the wars his ambition brings down upon them, his insatiable avidity, and the vexatious conduct of his ministers press harder on them than their own dissensions would have done? What do they gain if the very tranquility they enjoy is one of their miseries? Tranquility is found also in dungeons, but is that enough to make them desirable places to live in? The Greeks imprisoned in the cave of the Cyclops lived there very tranquilly, while they were awaiting their turn to be devoured. To say that a man gives himself gratuitously is to say what is absurd and inconceivable. Such an act is null and illegitimate, from the mere fact that he who does so is out of his mind. To say the same of a whole people is to suppose a people of madmen, and madness creates no right. Even if each man could alienate himself, he could not alienate his children. They are born men and free. Their liberty belongs to them, and no one but they has the right to dispose of it. Before they come to years of discretion, the father can, in their name, lay down conditions for their preservation and well-being, but he cannot give them, irrevocably and without conditions. Such a gift is contrary to the ends of nature and exceeds the rights of paternity. It would therefore be necessary, in order to legitimize an arbitrary government, that in every generation the people should be in a position to accept or reject it. But were this so, the government would no longer be arbitrary. To renounce liberty is to renounce being a man, to surrender the rights of humanity and even its duties. For him who renounces everything, no indemnity is possible. Such a renunciation is incompatible with man's nature. To remove all liberty from his will is to remove all morality from his acts. Finally, it is an empty and contradictory convention that sets up, on the one side, absolute authority, and on the other, unlimited obedience. Is it not clear that we can be under no obligation to a person from whom we have the right to exact everything? Does not this condition alone, in the absence of equivalence or exchange, in itself involve the nullity of the act? For what right can my slave have against me, when all that he has belongs to me, and his right being mine, this right of mine against myself is a phrase devoid of meaning. Grotius and the rest find in war another origin for the so-called right of slavery. The victor having, as they hold, the right of killing the vanquished, the latter can buy back his life at the price of his liberty, and this convention is the more legitimate because it is to the advantage of both parties. But it is clear that this supposed right to kill the conquered is by no means deducible from the state of war. Men, from the mere fact that, while they are living in their primitive independence, they have no mutual relations stable enough to constitute either the state of peace or the state of war, cannot be naturally enemies. War is constituted by a relation between things and not between persons. And as the state of war cannot arise out of simple personal relations, but only out of real relations, 
private war, or war of man with man, can exist neither in the state of nature, where there is no constant property, nor in the social state, where everything is under the authority of the laws. Individual combats, duels, and encounters are acts which cannot constitute a state, while the private wars, authorized by the establishments of Louis IX, King of France, and suspended by the peace of God, are abuses of feudalism, in itself an absurd system, if ever there was one, and contrary to the principles of natural right and to all good polity. War, then, is a relation not between man and man, but between state and state, and individuals are enemies only accidentally, not as men, nor even as citizens, but as soldiers, not as members of their country, but as its defenders. Finally, each state can have for enemies only other states, and not men, for between things disparate in nature, there can be no real relation. Furthermore, this principle is in conformity with the established rules of all times and the constant practice of all civilized peoples. Declarations of war are intimations less to powers than to their subjects. The foreigner, whether king, individual, or people, who robs, kills, or detains the subjects without declaring war on the prince, is not an enemy, but a brigand. Even in real war, a just prince, while laying hands in the enemy's country on all that belongs to the public, respects the lives and goods of individuals. He respects rights on which his own are founded. The object of the war being the destruction of the hostile state, the other side has a right to kill its defenders while they are bearing arms, but as soon as they lay them down and surrender, they cease to be enemies or instruments of the enemy and become once more merely men whose life no one has any right to take. Sometimes it is possible to kill the state without killing a single one of its members, and war gives no right which is not necessarily to the gaining of its object. These principles are not those of Grotius. They are not based on the authority of poets, but derived from the nature of reality and based on reason. The right of conquest has no foundation other than the right of the strongest. If war does not give the conqueror the right to massacre the conquered peoples, the right to enslave them cannot be based upon a right which does not exist. No one has a right to kill an enemy except when he cannot make him a slave, and the right to enslave him cannot therefore be derived from the right to kill him. It is accordingly an unfair exchange to make him buy at the price of his liberty, his life, over which the victor holds no right. Is it not clear that there is a vicious circle in founding the right of life and death on the right of slavery, and the right of slavery on the right of life and death? Even if we assume this terrible right to kill everybody, I maintain that a slave made in war or a conquered people is under no obligation to a master, except to obey him as far as he is compelled to do so. By taking an equivalent for his life, the victor has not done him a favor. Instead of killing him without profit, he has killed him usefully. So far, then, is he from acquiring over him any authority in addition to that of force, that the state of war continues to subsist between them. Their mutual relation is the effect of it, and the usage of the right of war does not imply a treaty of peace. A convention has indeed been made. But this convention, so far from destroying the state of war, presupposes its continuance. So, from whatever aspect we regard the question, the right of slavery is null and void, not only as being illegitimate, but also because it is absurd and meaningless. The words slave and right contradict each other and are mutually exclusive. It will always be equally foolish for a man to say to a man or to a people, I make with you a convention, wholly at your expense and wholly to my advantage. I shall keep it as long as I like, and you will keep it as long as I like. But note one. The Romans, who understood and respected the right of war more than any other nation on earth, carried their scruples on this head so far that a citizen was not allowed to serve as a volunteer without engaging himself expressly against the enemy, 
and against such and such an enemy by name a legion in which the younger cato was seeing his first service under papilius having been reconstructed the elder cato wrote to papilius that if he wished his son to continue serving under him he must administer to him a new military oath because the first having been annulled he was no longer able to bear arms against the enemy the same cato wrote to his son telling him to take great care not to go into battle before taking his new oath i know that the siege of clusium and other isolated events can be quoted against me but i am citing laws and customs the romans are the people that least often transgressed its laws and no other people has had such good ones chapter five that we must always go back to a first convention even if i granted all that i have been refuting the friends of despotism would be no better off there will always be a great difference between subduing a multitude and ruling a society even if scattered individuals were successively enslaved by one man however numerous they might be i still see no more than a master and his slaves and certainly not a people and its ruler i see what may be termed an aggregation but not an association there is as yet neither public good nor body politic the man in question even if he has enslaved half the world is still only an individual his interest apart from that of others is still a purely private interest if this same man comes to die his empire after him remains scattered and without unity as an oak falls and dissolves into a heap of ashes when the fire has consumed it a people says grotius can give itself to a king then according to grotius a people is a people before it gives itself the gift is itself a civil act and implies public deliberation it would be better before examining the act by which a people gives itself to a king to examine that by which it has become a people for this act being necessarily prior to the other is the true foundation of society indeed if there were no prior convention where unless the election were unanimous would be the obligation on the minority to submit to the choice of the majority how have a hundred men who wish for a master the right to vote on behalf of ten who do not the law of majority voting is itself something established by convention and presupposes unanimity on one occasion at least chapter six the social compact i suppose men to have reached the point at which the obstacles in the way of their preservation in the state of nature show their power of resistance to be greater than the resources at the disposal of each individual for his maintenance in that state that primitive condition can then subsist no longer and the human race would perish unless it changed its manner of existence but as men cannot engender new forces but only unite and direct existing ones they have no other means of preserving themselves than the formation by aggregation of a sum of forces great enough to overcome the resistance these they have to bring into play by means of a single motive power and cause to act in concert This sum of forces can only arise where several persons come together, but as the force and liberty of each man are the chief instruments of his self-preservation, how can he pledge them without harming his own interests and neglecting the care he owes to himself? This difficulty, in its bearing on my present subject, may be stated in the following terms. The problem is to find a form of association which will defend and protect with the whole common force the person and goods of each associate and in which each while uniting himself with all may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before this is the fundamental problem of which the social contract provides the solution the clauses of this contract are so determined by the nature of the act that the slightest modification would make them vain and ineffective so that although they have perhaps never been formally set forth they are everywhere the same and everywhere tacitly admitted and recognized until on the violation of the social compact each regains his original rights and resumes his natural liberty 
while losing the conventional liberty in favor of which he renounced it. These clauses, properly understood, may be reduced to one, the total alienation of each associate together with all his rights to the whole community. For in the first place, as each gives himself absolutely, the conditions are the same for all. And this being so, no one has any interest in making them burdensome to others. Moreover, the alienation being without reserve, the union is as perfect as it can be, and no associate has anything more to demand. For if the individuals retained certain rights, as there would be no common superior to decide between them and the public, each being on one point his own judge, would ask to be so on all. The state of nature would thus continue, and the association would necessarily become inoperative or tyrannical. Finally, each man, in giving himself to all, gives himself to nobody. And as there is no associate over whom he does not acquire the same right as he yields others over himself, he gains an equivalent for everything he loses and an increase of force for the preservation of what he has. If then we discard from the social compact what is not of its essence, we shall find that it reduces itself to the following terms. Each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will, and, in our corporate capacity, we receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole. At once, in place of the individual personality of each contracting party, this act of association creates a moral and collective body, composed of as many members as the assembly contains voters, and receiving from this act its unity, its common identity, its life, and its will. The public person, so formed by the union of all other persons, formerly took the name of city, and now takes that of republic or body politic. It is called by its members state when passive, sovereign when active, and power when compared with others like itself. Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of people and are severally called citizens as sharing in sovereign power and subjects as being under the laws of the state. But these terms are often confused and taken one for another. It is enough to know how to distinguish them when they are being used with precision. Footnote 1. The real meaning of this word has been almost wholly lost in modern times. Most people mistake a town for a city and a townsman for a citizen. They do not know that houses make a town, but citizens a city. The same mistake long ago cost the Carthaginians dear. I have never read of the title of citizens being given to the subjects of any prince, not even the ancient Macedonians or the English of today, though they are nearer liberty than anyone else. The French alone everywhere familiarly adopt the name of citizens because, as can be seen from their dictionaries, they have no idea of its meaning. Otherwise, they would be guilty in usurping it of the crime of les majestés. Among them, the name expresses a virtue and not a right. When Baudin spoke of our citizens and townsmen, he fell into a bad blunder in taking the one class for the other. Monsieur d'Alembert has avoided the error, and in his article on Geneva has clearly distinguished the four orders of men, or even five, counting mere foreigners, who dwell in our town, of which only two compose the Republic. No other French writer, to my knowledge, has understood the real meaning of the word citizen. Chapter 7. The Sovereign. This formula shows us that the act of association comprises a mutual undertaking between the public and the individuals, and that each individual, in making a contract, as we may say, with himself, is bound in a double capacity. As a member of the sovereign, he is bound to the individuals, and as a member of the state, to the sovereign. But the maxim of civil right, that no one is bound by undertakings made to himself, does not apply in this case, for there is a great difference between incurring an obligation to yourself and incurring one to a whole of which you form a part. 
Attention must further be called to the fact that public deliberation, while competent to bind all the subjects to the sovereign, because of the two different capacities in which each of them may be regarded, cannot, for the opposite reason, bind the sovereign to itself, and that it is consequently against the nature of the body politic for the sovereign to impose on itself a law which it cannot infringe. Being able to regard itself in only one capacity, it is in the position of an individual who makes a contract with himself, and this makes it clear that there neither is nor can be any kind of fundamental law binding on the body of the people, not even the social contract itself. This does not mean that the body politic cannot enter into undertakings with others, provided the contract is not infringed by them, or in relation to what is external to it, it becomes a simple being, an individual. But the body politic or the sovereign, drawing its being wholly from the sanctity of the contract, can never bind itself, even to an outsider, to do anything derogatory to the original act, for instance, to alienate any part of itself, or to submit to another sovereign. Violation of the act by which it exists would be self-annihilation, and that which is itself nothing can create nothing. Again, the sovereign, being formed wholly of the individuals who compose it, neither has nor can have any interest contrary to theirs, and consequently, the sovereign power need give no guarantee to its subjects, because it is impossible for the body to wish to hurt all its members. We shall see also later on that it cannot hurt any in particular. The sovereign, merely by virtue of what it is, is always what it should be. This, however, is not the case with the relation of the subjects to the sovereign, which despite the common interest would have no security that they would fulfill their undertakings unless it found means to assure itself of their fidelity. In fact, each individual as a man may have a particular will contrary or dissimilar to the general will which he has as a citizen. His particular interest may speak to him quite differently from the common interest. His absolute and naturally independent existence may make him look upon what he owes to the common cause as a gratuitous contribution, the loss of which will do less harm to others than the payment of it is burdensome to himself. And, regarding the moral person which constitutes the state as a persona ficta, because not a man, he may wish to enjoy the rights of citizenship without being ready to fulfill the duties of a subject. The continuance of such an injustice could not but prove the undoing of the body politic. In order, then, that the social compact may not be an empty formula, it tacitly includes the undertaking, which alone can give force to the rest, that whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be compelled to do so by the whole body. This means nothing less than that he will be forced to be free. For this is the condition which, by giving each citizen to his country, secures him against all personal dependence. In this lies the key to the working of the political machine. This alone legitimizes civil undertakings, which without it would be absurd, tyrannical, and liable to the most frightful abuses. Chapter 8. The Civil State the passage from the state of nature to the civil state produces a very remarkable change in man by substituting justice for instinct in his conduct and giving his actions the morality they had formerly lacked. Then only, when the voice of duty takes the place of physical impulses and right of appetite, does man, who so far had considered only himself, find that he is forced to act on different principles and to consult his reason before listening to his inclinations. Although in this state he deprives himself of some advantages which he got from nature, he gains in return others so great, his faculties are so stimulated and developed, his ideas so extended, his feelings so ennobled, and his whole soul so uplifted, that, did not the abuses of this new condition often degrade him below that which he left, he would be bound to bless continually the happy moment which took him from it forever, and instead of a stupid, unimaginative animal, made him an intelligent being and a man. 
Let us draw up the whole account in terms easily commensurable. What man loses by the social contract is his natural liberty and an unlimited right to everything he tries to get and succeeds in getting. What he gains is civil liberty and the proprietorship of all he possesses. If we are to avoid mistake in weighing one against the other, we must clearly distinguish natural liberty, which is bounded only by the strength of the individual, from civil liberty, which is limited by the general will, and possession, which is merely the effect of force or the right of the first occupier, from property, which can be founded only on a positive title. We might, over and above all this, add to what man acquires in the civil state moral liberty, which alone makes him truly master of himself, for the mere impulse of appetite is slavery, while obedience to a law which we prescribe to ourselves is liberty. But I have already said too much on this head, and the philosophical meaning of the word liberty does not now concern us. Chapter 9. Real Property Each member of the community gives himself to it, at the moment of its foundation, just as he is, with all the resources at his command, including the goods he possesses. This act does not make possession in changing hands change its nature and becomes property in the hands of the sovereign. But as the forces of the city are incomparably greater than those of an individual, public possession is also, in fact, stronger and more irrevocable without being any more legitimate, at any rate from the point of view of foreigners. For the state, in relation to its members, is master of all their goods by the social contract, which, within the state, is the basis of all rights. But, in relation to other powers, it is only so by the right of the first occupier, which it holds from its members. The right of the first occupier, though more real than the right of the strongest, becomes a real right only when the right of property has already been established. Every man has naturally a right to everything he needs, but the positive act which makes him proprietor of one thing excludes him from everything else. Having his share, he ought to keep to it and can have no further right against the community. This is why the right of the first occupier, which in the state of nature is so weak, claims the respect of every man in civil society. In this right, we are respecting not so much what belongs to another as what does not belong to ourselves. In general, to establish the right of the first occupier over a plot of ground, the following conditions are necessary. First, the land must not yet be inhabited. Secondly, a man must occupy only the amount he needs for his subsistence. And in the third place, possession must be taken not by an empty ceremony, but by labor and cultivation, the only sign of proprietorship that should be respected by others in default of a legal title. In granting the right of first occupancy to necessity and labor, are we not really stretching it as far as it can go? Is it possible to leave such a right unlimited? Is it to be enough to set foot on a plot of common ground in order to be able to call yourself at once the master of it? Is it to be enough that a man has the strength to expel others for a moment in order to establish his right to prevent them from ever returning? How can a man or a people seize an immense territory and keep it from the rest of the world except by a punishable usurpation, since all others are being robbed by such an act of the place of habitation and the means of subsistence which nature gave them in common? When Nunez Balboa, standing on the seashore, took possession of the South Seas and the whole of South America in the name of the Crown of Castile, was that enough to dispossess all their actual inhabitants and to shut out from them all the princes of the world? On such a showing, these ceremonies are idly multiplied, and the Catholic king need only take possession all at once from his apartment of the whole universe, merely making a subsequent reservation about what was already in the possession of other princes. We can imagine how the lands of individuals, where they were contiguous and came to be united, became the public territory, and how the right of sovereignty, extending from the subjects over the lands they held, became at once real and personal. The possessors were thus made more dependent, and the forces at their command used to guarantee their fidelity. The advantage of this does not seem to have been felt by ancient monarchs, 
who called themselves king of the Persians, Scythians, or Macedonians, and seemed to regard themselves more as rulers of men than as masters of a country. Those of the present day more cleverly called themselves kings of France, Spain, England, etc. Thus holding the land, they are quite confident of holding the inhabitants. The peculiar fact about this alienation is that, in taking over the goods of individuals, the community, so far from despoiling them, only assures them legitimate possession and changes usurpation into a true right and enjoyment into proprietorship. Thus, the possessors, being regarded as depositaries of the public good, and having their rights, respected by all the members of the state and maintained against foreign aggression by all its forces, have, by a session which benefits both the public and still more themselves, acquired, so to speak, all that they gave up. This paradox may be easily explained by the distinction between the rights which the sovereign and the proprietor have over the same estate, as we shall see later on. It may also happen that men begin to unite one with another before they possess anything, and that, subsequently, occupying a tract of country which is enough for all, they enjoy it in common, or share it out among themselves, either equally or according to a scale fixed by the sovereign. However the acquisition be made, the right which each individual has to his own estate is always subordinate to the right which the community has over all. Without this, there would be neither stability in the social tie, nor real force in the exercise of sovereignty. I shall end this chapter and this book by remarking on a fact on which the whole social system should rest. That is that, instead of destroying natural inequality, the fundamental compact substitutes, for such physical inequality as nature may have set up between men, an equality that is moral and legitimate, and that men, who may be unequal in strength or intelligence, become every one equal by convention and legal right. Footnote 1. Under bad governments, this equality is only apparent and illusory. It serves only to keep the pauper in his poverty and the rich man in the position he has usurped. In fact, laws are always of use to those who possess and harmful to those who have nothing, from which it follows that the social state is advantageous to men only when all have something and none have too much. <laughs>